uh, not a perfect day today in terms of weather, but uh, it, uh, it is good to see the, ch- the house of God um, full and, um, and still filling. That's good. Um, just a quick reminder that we are going to be uh, starting our worship in a few minutes. There are certain announcements, actually only one that we would like to uh, kind of emphasize today. All the others can be accessed uh, in the Telegram and WhatsApp groups now that we have as a church. Um, Nothing uh, specific uh, as of this, except of this one. So for this one, I'd like to invite Maria to come and share um, uh, uh, about it. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Um, We are happy that the day arrived for long announced uh, couples retreat uh, will happen and start this afternoon. So we just want to emphasize several announcements, very important. We will start at 3 this afternoon and we hope to finish until 4.30. And we would like to ask you, if it's possible, come on time. We would like to start at 3. I know that it will be a little bit of rush after the lunch, but let's try to be here at least 10 minutes earlier so we can, try, uh, we can start at 3. The reason why is that some of you who would like to use the child care, I would like to ask you to bring your children and take them immediately to Sabbath school, the big classroom, because Ruta will be there uh, to take the children and and to to play with them and uh, entertain them until we will be here. And the second reason is because, uh, praise God, we were able to um, organize the translation from uh, English to Arabic. Pastor Samuel will be with us this afternoon to translate. So come uh, to check, to receive your devices, and to be ready to to start at 3. And the last announcement is that uh, we had a very nice group of people who signed up for this seminar. But if you still did not uh, sign up and you would like to come to check it out, we would like to open possibility for you to come to be blessed and to bless other younger couples who are among us. So thank you so much, and I'm very happy uh, to see you this afternoon. Thank you, Maria. Uh, This looks really nice here. So I believe that once we come and once we start uh, uh, thinking and learning about about this topic of uh, family uh, and marriage, it's going to be a nice event for all of us. As we wait, just wanted to remind you of a beautiful truth that is written here in the Bible. And it's found in Romans 8. One verse, one single short verse, but so, so filled with, with meaning. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And your presence here, my presence here is a testament that we are in Jesus. Just wanted to remind you, there is no condemnation on those who are in Christ Jesus. And, Jesus, and uh, Apostle Paul knew that we might be facing challenges, personal challenges. But yet he wrote this verse. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let us enjoy this statement, this truth as we wait our worship to begin. Amen.
Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can be in your house. And we are so thankful that you have promised that you will be with us. And especially today, as it is Sabbath, the day that you have established so that we can talk to you, so that we can have a relationship with you in a more meaningful way than on the, work, on the working days. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ and salvation that you have given us through him. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, our attempts here to praise you and to worship you uh, would be acceptable to you and pleasing to you. And help us and inspire us with your spirit so that we can do that and have joy and, um, and be glad as we're doing this. We pray all these, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for you righteous acts have been revealed. This is from Revelation 15.4. As we reflect on the holiness and the glory of the Lord Almighty, let our voices unite in singing, singing praises to the blessed Trinity, echoing the angel's eternal hymn. Hymn number 73, Holy, Holy, Holy.
praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. Psalms 147, 1. Let our voices rise in jubilant song, joining the chorus of angels and saints throughout the ages, as we rejoice in the wondrous works of our Lord and King, Jesus Christ. Let's sing together hymn number 27. soul and all that is within me bless his holy name psalms 103 1 let every fiber of our being join in praise to the king of heaven as we offer our tribute of gratitude for his boundless grace and mercy echoing the eternal anthem of praise sung by angels and all creation let's sing our opening song, hymn number four, and let's stand for this hymn. Let's stand for God for this hymn.
Church, uh, church, happy Sabbath. Our offering greeting today said, some people argue that they do not return their tithes and offering because they cannot agree with the way the church uses its resources and be because they do not perceive transparency in the use of the church funds. How should we act when we do not agree with the way things are conducted in the church? This question is so important that I would like to answer it. With a quote from Ellen G. White, she says, some have been dissatisfied and he have said, I, I will no longer pay my tithe, for I have no confidence in the way things are managed at the heart of the work. But, we, but will you rob God because you think management of the work is not right? May, may you make your complaint plainly and openly, in the right spirit to the proper ones, send in your petitions for things to be adjusted and set in order, but do not withdraw from the work of God and prove unfaithful because all others are not doing Christ gospel workers. The code te teaches us three profound truths. One, when the, you choose to be unfaithful because in your pre Receptions, the church leaders are not managing the resources properly, and you are robbing God. Two, present your inquiries to competent persons who manage God's church. Do not follow the revolutionary uh, spirit of our age that teaches us the exposure of the one way to solve problems. Three, present your doubts, uh, doubts in a proper Christian spirit. Ask God to put the love in your word and give the wisdom as you submit your questions. Act as some, someone who wants to help and not destroy. The quote by stating, 
but not, do not withdraw from the work of God and prove unfaithful because others are the, not doing right. Do not withdraw from the work of God. He has, he has work to do on his earth and that invites you to join him. Maybe as, we, as you have lost confidence in the way God works, has been carried out. If that in the, is the case, I want you to invite you to pray and ask God for the wisdom uh, to act accordingly to, for the prophetic guidance and uh, especially to stay involved with the cause of the truth by being unfaithful. Now I ask the deacons to stand up and collect the uh, offering and tithe. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for Sabbath. I thank you for everything you have done for us. God, I ask you to give us the wisdom as we put our tithe and offering. I ask you, I ask you to bless this offering, to multiply it, and it helps many of people. God, I ask you to give peace between the countries and in the nations that all the wars will stop. I, God, I ask you to be with everybody who's in need and I ask you for to be with our speaker today, Pastor Rick, as he sa says your message. And the Holy Spirit will help us to understand each word and apply it in our life. In Jesus' name, we ask you all of this. Amen.
Can you think of something? <laughs> I think we have a mic. Can you think of something that you made? And you want to tell me? Tell me one thing that you made that was very special. I made this strawberry hair clip, but it's not for anyone. A strawberry hair clip. Beautiful. Ah. I have made a card for my mom and dad. A card for your mom and dad. I bet they love that. Beautiful. Anything else? I made a painting for my mom and dad. A painting. Wow. What was the picture? I drew my dad and mom, and I made fun of my dad, and I put a dog and a cat. <laughs> I love it. I'm sure that they love that, too. Yes? I drew a heart for my mom and dad. Okay, you drew a heart. I, I, I did a beautiful drawing, like, two weeks ago. Wow, recent. Okay. Beautiful. Sadara, you have something. Ah. Uh, this one is a glass up. Is a what? You made something special? Yes. How fun. Did you make something special? Not that you can remember. I bet you did. You know, think of it. I brought you something this morning and I that I want to show you. And it's something special to our family because our children made them. It's been a few years, but these are made out of clay. Have you ever made anything out of clay from the dirt? Yes. See, here's a bowl, pretty bowl. This one is a fruit. Have you ever seen a fruit like this? It's called a mangosteen. <laughs> and there's one more. And this one is a cup you can drink out of. It's about your size. <laughs> These are very special because they were handmade. And you know that to make something out of clay, you need to take the clay and you need to work out all the bubbles out of it. And then you need to form it into whatever shape you want it to be. And then you have to dry it. And then you put it in the oven. And then you take it out again. You know what you do next? You put glaze on it. That's right. And then you put it back in the oven. Now, imagine... If I spent time making something like this, and then I decide to put it up on the shelf and say, you're very special. In fact, you're so special, I'm going to worship you. What would you think about that? Would you think that would be wise? No. No, you just made it out of something that God had made. God says to us, in 2 Kings, he says this, Do not worship other gods. What kind of things might be a god? Do we worship things like this? No, we don't. That's right. No, he's, he says, 2 Kings chapter 17, Don't worship other gods. Don't bow down to them or serve them. Don't sacrifice to them, but instead worship only the Lord. So I want you to think about that. God is the only one who is worthy of our worship. Thank you for listening. And happy Sabbath. The scripture reading here today is Isaiah 42, the verses 5 and 6. 
open our Bible, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 5 and 6. This is what, this is what God the Lord says. He, would, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the, the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a confident for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Let us kneel for a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that everything that you are doing for us, uh, we thank you for you are always uh, taking care of us. We ask you to be with the old people are sick, with the people that are need needs. Uh, we want to be ask you to be with the to that the wars to stop in the world, that uh, in, uh, peace will be in the world, and uh, we want you to ask you to be with Pastor Rick, uh, that he says the words and to be with him, and uh, we thank you. We, <coughs> That uh, we want, we ask you that we will be with the church, that the church will be improved and will be with the uh, MEU University, with the students and the, with the university. We thank you for everything that you are doing for us, and uh, in all of this, we, we in your name, Amen. Your tenderness, O Lord of the universe, to you I raise my prayers. If I live, it is by faith that the meaning of my life is honored. I heard your call, O Lord, ringing deep within me, an echo that responded in my heart to the throbbing melody. With your guidance, I walked my path with a thirst longing for you. I am terrified by the noise of the sea and the sound of thunder, but I get solace in you at dawn with your abundance of contentment and generosity. O creator of the universe, who knows, except you, the secret of existence? How many secrets and amazing signs are in you, Lord? My God, if I pray, I have no one but you to answer my call, and when I bear my burdens, I have you as my consolation. I put my desires and hopes in you. For you are my refuge, and through my return to you and in you, I am saved. حنانك يا رب الأكوان إليك رفعت صلاتي أنا إن أحيا فبالإيمان يشرف معنى حياتي سمعت نداءك يا ربي يجلجل في أعماقي صدى يتجاوب في قلبي مع النغم الخفاق فسرت بهديك في دربي وبظما المشتاق لمن هلك الصافي العذب 
Right. How's this? Is that a little bit better? Okay. When I came in this morning, I thought maybe I got the wrong Sabbath for my sermon, but I think this is for a different program. So uh, look past it to the screen so that we can share the Word of God this morning. The title of my message is Bring the Evidence, and that alone brings some people a question mark about what passages we're going to speak on this morning. 
But before we do, I want to pray, and I want to pray not only for the message, but for my father-in-law, who we just got notified about half an hour ago is in ICU, so, and not doing so well. So let's pray. pray. Lord God, we lift you up, and we know that you want to speak through your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would not only speak to all of us here, but to convict our hearts and to use us as your ambassadors. Please be with Marcia's father just now. We seek you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For the last uh, month and a half, many of you know that I, I had a shoulder surgery, and uh, I have one at least one, maybe a few other uh, compatriots in here, Lena and I compare notes all the time, and I think I can raise my hands earlier than she could, but it's still a lot of pain. But early in the surgery, I would not be able to sleep after the surgery. I, uh, I would go to my balcony window, and I would sit there, and I would just simply pray. And what I would pray for is all the people representing the apartments all surrounding the northern part of Beirut that we look over onto. We look over onto Fanar University there, also onto uh, in the distance. If you come to my house, you can hear me talk about uh, Junia and Byblos in the distance And I always mention Dog River, which is the demarcation point of almost all of Lebanon's history. But when I get up in the middle of the night and lights are on, I can't help but think of how many people across Lebanon do not yet know the fullness of the message from the Word of God that we know. How little our footprint is in this country. And how we are called to march forward with God's great good news. This country, ancient, beautiful, glorious. I describe Lebanon. I I have fallen in love with Lebanon. I don't deny it. As the place where you can have orange trees along the coastline, avocado trees, bananas, and as you go up in the mountains, apples, cherries, nectarines, peaches, and even a few mangoes are grown here. But there are five and a half million, actually about a million less people than there were about four years ago. You get that, right? A million less people than there were about four years ago. Five and a half million people who we are called to share the light with. And this country represents one out of 20 countries that represents 600, maybe you can't see it behind the decorations, but 601 million people across the 20 nations of MENA. And I'll be honest with you, I sometimes weep at the weakness of our little hamstrung church with its few workers, with its few members, and say, Lord, how will this work ever be accomplished? We have about the same amount of members as the Loma Linda University Church spread across these 20 countries. How will we do it? How are you engaged in this work? Now today, in order to bring the Word of God to you, um, this message was actually processed about four weeks ago when I was reading for my morning worship the chapters of Isaiah 40 through the end of the book. And Isaiah 40 to 55, if you've ever read it, are some of the most rich passages in all of the scriptures. And I think just on the three chapters that we will talk about briefly 
today, and I will go quickly, you could probably, probably write 50 or 60 sermons, Rami, for your future, out of these three chapters. There is plenty of goodness in these chapters. There are, and what I will share with you today is a confrontation of our own generation, the hope of the Messiah, and the purpose for which we ultimately live. See, Isaiah 41 to 43 has something for everyone. It has the fear nots, which there are many. It has reassurance. It has strength. It has confronting sin. It has the shining light on Christ. It has the power of God, the purpose for your life, the missionary calling, and seeing the Redeemer, and it has plenty of hope. But we begin with a courtroom scene. It's not probably your most fond thing if you've ever been in a courtroom. If you've ever been tried before a judge or a jury, it's not your favorite memory. But the setting in Isaiah 41 is very clearly a courtroom scene. When we see this courtroom scene, we see that there are words in there like judgment, like summons, like evidence. And we come to the courtroom and who is on trial here? You could read into it that there are many on trial here, but I believe very firmly that in this particular passage, God places himself on trial before the nations. God places himself as evidence before the courtroom to say, I am here, try me, I'm on trial. And he asks others to bring the evidence. In this trial, the makers of idols bring their evidence, those who are tempting others to worship false gods. The courtroom also shows that the worship of idol, worshipers of idols are there in the courtroom and that ultimately God puts his own people on trial as evidence on whether he is the God he is supposed to be. Do you know that in the great controversy that you are evidence of who God is? And what you do, what you think, what you believe, the motivations of your heart are all part of the trial of the universe for who God ultimately is. You are part of the evidence for who God is. We start in Isaiah 41.1, and uh, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 41, we are going to go rather rapidly through this. But let me, before I read this, just give you a little bit of background. Uh, there was King David, right, who had the unified kingdom, his son, King Solomon, and then as soon as Solomon gave the glory of God away through many ways, the nation was divided and eventually we come to King Hezekiah. When we come to King Hezekiah, we know some of the amazing things God did, making the sun stand still, lengthening King Hezekiah's life by 15 years, and also delaying the assault of the Assyrians on the kingdom of Jerusalem, on the nation, the, sorry, the city of Jerusalem. All of these things God did for Hezekiah because he was a righteous king, one of the few in Israel and Judah's history. One of the very few, but even a righteous king made stupid decisions. At the end, when God said, your city will not be taken over by the enemies, the Assyrians, what did Hezekiah say? Oh, I'm so glad it won't be during my time. Is that the right response for a king? Oh, I'm glad it won't be during my time. He doesn't want his case to look bad in history. I'm glad it won't be in my time. Uh, delay it, Lord. Go ahead, delay it. So here we come to the, the courtroom. 
Isaiah 41.1, keep silence before me, O coastlands. Let the people renew their strength. Let them come near. Let them speak. Let them come near together for judgment. And it's not talking here about God giving his people strength. It's actually speaking about the people who are going to accuse God. It reminds me of the passage in Job that says, stand up like a man. Stand up. Say something. In this passage, those who are accusing God are speaking up. They are supposed to kind of stand firm and give it their best shot in the judgment. We go on and we see the ultimate declaration of who God is. It is I, the Lord, the first and the last. I alone am he. And why? Because the trial is about whether God is really God or whether false idols, whether false gods have anything that they can add to life. Isaiah 41, 6 and 7, everyone helped his neighbor. This is the humor of God here, right? The humor of God, everyone helped his neighbor, said to his brother, be of good courage. So the craftsman encouraged the goldsmith. He who smooths the, with the hammer inspired him who strikes with the anvil, saying, it is ready for soldering. Then he fastened it with pegs that it might not totter. Do you understand this? This is those who are crafting idols, encouraging each other. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. And they, they put a nail in it so that it doesn't totter. Is that a God? If you have to nail it down, is it a God? In the opening arguments of the trial, God shows his true nature. Here in Isaiah 41, 9 and 10, you whom have taken from the ends of the earth and have called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you. I have not cast you away. In these opening arguments, God reveals his true nature. What is his true nature? His true nature is that God tells those on trial, his own people, openly, tenderly, that he is their God. You can hear it in this appeal. Why do you choose, O people, something that cannot save you? Why do you turn to what is dead? I am alive and I have called you. You are mine. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He turns to his people and says, Why did you abandon me? For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying, Fear not, I will help you. And here again, Maybe a little bit of the humor of God. Fear not, you worm, O Jacob. Have you ever thought of yourself as a worm? It's not a very pleasant thought, eating dirt all day long, making compost out of rotten things. Fear not, you worm, O Jacob. God puts his people in their proper place. You men of Israel, I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. This is the insertion in Isaiah of the concept of the Redeemer God. God is essentially saying, why did you turn to false gods? Why did you abandon me? I love you. Why would you forget the love that I have for you? Even, he says in this passage, with strong reassurance that even he will restore 
the poor to their proper place. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. The God of Israel will not forsake them. He hears those who are neglected and poor. 4120 that they may see and know and consider and understand together. It's all about understanding who God is. But it doesn't stop there. Again, it says, present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Witnesses are now being called, called to demonstrate what the idols did for them. In this passage, it says, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things. What were they? That we may consider them and know the latter of them that declare us the things to come. And in this passage, God is clearly saying, can idols create? Huh? Can idols create? Can they tell the past? Can they predict the future? Do they have power to make the future happen in the way we think it's going to happen? And ultimately, the answer is given. In cross examination, the idols are declared worthless. Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. Indeed, they are worthless. All their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. Wow. This is pretty strong language, is it not? In my opinion, this is a cosmic picture of what Elijah encountered at Mount Carmel with all the prophets of Baal before him calling out on God to answer when the prophets of Baal had danced had done everything they could they had they had cut themselves in order to get the gods of Baal to answer but God Elijah's God after they had dug trenches and filled them with water as everything was consumed in a powerful demonstration of the true and almighty God. We, friends, are in a conflict. And I believe that from the beginning of the year till now that I've never seen a moment in my seven years here where the conflict is being demonstrated before my eyes more. God is there saying, what are you trusting in? And I'm going to give a moment of application here. And I'll be honest with you, I have a few of these. Any one of these could be the end of a sermon. So if after my moments of application, you decide I've had enough, this is good enough for me, and you get up and walk out, I won't be offended. But I have more than one. And I don't know if the next one will be more applicable to your life than the previous one. Let me just ask you, what are the false gods of your life that are powerless to bring you anything? Is it material wealth? Is it time wasters endlessly scrolling through news or Instagram or whatever it is? Is it your reputation? Is it your wealth? Is it technology? Is it looking good? Is it some private sin that only you and God know about. And I'll just say very strongly that false gods are powerless to bring you satisfaction. And I didn't hear any amens. We know it, don't we? We know how empty they are. We know how absolutely abandoned any false god is. Why? Because they can't bring us satisfaction. Every false god in our lives only leaves us more empty than it was before.
But I don't want to stop there because Isaiah quickly in verse 42 goes to the one who can solve our problems. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, this messianic passage here, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Now, let me just ask you quickly, what are the coastlands in scripture? Anybody know? In this particular passage, it is talking about the coastlands as those who are dominated by other gods. And it stretches from Gaza all the way up the coast through Phoenicia. All the way through Syria, all the way to Turkey. These are the coastlands that were worshiping other gods. This was the capital of Baal worship in those days. Application question number two. How long has it been since you personally submitted your life to Christ and asked him to take you, to wash you, and to make you again completely dedicated to him? How long has it been? Are you completely his today? Jesus is the answer. Not endless scrolling, not material wealth, not your reputation, nothing else. Jesus is the answer to your life. He will bring you justice. He will not snuff out the plea of your heart or the cry of your voice. But once again, it doesn't stop there. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7 I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. Listen to this beautiful picture of what God has called for you and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, to those who sit in darkness in the prison house. In this passage, we can see clearly that God is treating his people as brand new again. He would not be saying this if they were not a redeemed people. He he is calling them back to his covenant no matter how far they have fallen. He is telling them that he will keep his covenant with us even when we have broken it hundreds of times. Amen. He is faithful. And he does not stop at renewing his covenant promises. He, but he says clearly, I will make you a light to the Gentiles. So when he pointed to the coastlands, he was pointing at Lebanon saying, I will make you a light to the Gentiles. Have we accepted that purpose when we look at Beirut, when we look at North uh, Lebanon, when we look at South Lebanon? Have we accepted the promise of God that he will make you a light to the Gentiles? When I look at that picture stretching out over North Lebanon, I often weep a little bit because I know that we don't have any churches until we reach Bishmazine. And in Bishmazine, we have one church with about five or six people in it. Our footprint north of here in Lebanon is so weak, it's not even worth talking about. But if you go south of Lebanon, it's worse. If you go south of Beirut, you can go from Musaitbi all the way south. And where is there an Adventist church? 
We are empty of proclaiming the eternal gospel in this nation, except for in the city of Beirut and a few scattered believers throughout this country. Are we being faithful to the gospel, my friends? He will make you a light to the Gentiles to restore justice in the earth. In his efforts to bring justice, he gives us a job to do. For the Lord says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to a carved image. No image can handle the glory of God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Isn't that a nice way of saying it? And his praise from the ends of the earth. You go down to the sea and all that is in it, the coastlands, you inhabitants of them, that's us. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. Let the villages that Kedar inhabits, that's the desert places beyond, let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Selah, where are you? You're mentioned in scripture several times. <laughs> Let them see, shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. This passage paints Lebanon from top to bottom, from north to south, and it goes beyond to the desert places all the way where the villages of Kedar are. I don't know how you feel about it, my friends. But I'm not satisfied with where we've been yet. Isaiah 42, 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. So all of those who say, no, the law is gone. That is not the way God is going to be established through this land. He's going to do it how? How? Why here does God say that he's pleased for his righteousness sake? Why does he even emphasize the law in this place? Is it because God? Is it because God is a legalist? Oh, friends, we know that's not true because he's full of mercy and truth. He's full of forgiveness and compassion. God is no legalist. We make him into a legalist by how we respond to the law and grace in Scripture. But God is no legalist. But why does it say that he would be honored and the law will be exalted? How does that work? It's very easy. When God made the covenant with Israel in the book of Deuteronomy... He said if they would keep the law, that he would make them rise up among the nations because they would be more righteous, more holy, more honorable than all the other nations. Here's the passage. Therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statues and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that God has so near to it that the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all his law, which I set before you this day? See, God had intended to raise his people, Israel, up above as a light to the nations. What did Israel do? They turned to false gods. We are in danger of doing the same thing. We fear giving a honest witness because we may be persecuted. We fear being bold with our witness. Why? Because we don't want to stand out in a crowd. We're afraid to talk about the Sabbath. Why? Because we want to make peace with all the other people in this country. 
Now, trust me, I'm not saying that we should make enemies. I think everybody should know me well enough that I'm not pronouncing you to go out and, you know, take a sword in one hand and a Bible on the other like the Catholics came to Sri Lanka. The Portuguese, sorry, Portuguese descendants. That's how the Portuguese came to Sri Lanka. A Bible in one hand and a sword in the other, convert or die. We don't do that. That's not God's way. We proclaim the truth of who God is. And we are the repositories of God's character. He is asking us, are you the evidence of who God is? Bring the evidence. Isaiah continues, who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to the robbers? Was it not the Lord? Okay, so the Lord gave them to the Assyrians and the Babylonians because Israel had not followed them. I'm not making a statement of current wars and politics, but you can make your own conclusions. Was it not the Lord? He against whom they have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. Going back to Deuteronomy, they didn't follow him. They didn't care about God's law. They were tempted away to false idols. They bowed down and they were taken captive by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Who won the trial? Okay, the trial is real, right? False idols or real God? Who won the trial? Nobody's wanting to give me an answer in case it's a trick question. No trick in this. Martina, who won the trial? I know you knew this one. God won the trial. God is vindicated in every trial because his justice, his character, his truth, his power, and his grace, his compassion are clearly demonstrated throughout history. Thank you for whoever saying amen. And once the false gods are proved worthless and lifeless... And after God's people are called to repentance for their immoral acts. And once God's promises that the Messiah who would come and right all wrongs. And once God gives hope for justice to the downtrodden. There is still one more thing. That one more thing. Turn the page to Isaiah 43. There's one more thing, and you have to seal this in your memory because all that's gone before, he's turning us from false idols to the one true God. He's telling us that we are a light to the Gentiles. He's predicting that we can point to the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, who is on the throne of of the universe. But he's saying, if you do this, I guarantee you, If you do this, if you follow me, if you proclaim as a light to the Gentiles, you will suffer. God did not call you as a light to the Gentiles because it's going to be easy. God did not call you as a light to the Gentiles because it's going to be peaceful. God did not call Daniel to stay out of the lion's den and to go ahead and stop praying every day, did he? God didn't call Joseph into the house of Pharaoh to deny him. He does one more thing. Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, and I'm I'm referring to the church of God today as Israel. Hear me out. All who are children of Jesus, redeemed by Christ, are now children of Abraham. Amen? Amen. He who formed you, 
created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. With all these Valentine's things around, I kind of think that I, I'm, that this line, you are mine, is sort of beautiful right now, isn't it? I'm glad to be yours, dear, but I'm even more glad to be his. Amen? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Can you read in there the people of God going through the Red Sea? Sorry, Ruth. I'll fix it later. I'll get you a new one. I'm in her bill. <laughs> Can you read in here the people of Israel going through the... The wilderness, going through the Red Sea. Can you read in there? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fiery furnace. They were willing to bear the shame as people of God and say, I'll die before I worship another God. For I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Remember this. If you remember nothing else, if you remember nothing else, remember this. He claims you as his own. He claims your heart, your life as his These uh, things that Marcia shared uh, are made by our, by our son. And uh, she says, and our daughter. We may have a different opinion on that. But uh, we have kept them as precious because they were made by our child. How much more precious are you to God because you are personally created by him to be filled with his glory. You're not created to be filled with trash, not in your mind, not in your body. You are created by him to be filled for his glory. And as we walk around, as we interact, as we do things, as we show God's love, his glory gets brighter in us until we shine for him. Bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. You notice we're still in the court scene. You notice that? Asking for witnesses, asking for truth. What are you a witness of in your life? Have you seen God acting on your behalf? Have you seen in your life his faithfulness, his forgiveness, his mercy for you? Are you a witness in the court of the universe for who God is to you? Are you willing to stand up for him? You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen you, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No other before me. There is no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Nothing else can save you than the Lord Jesus Christ. No other religion no material thing, no object of, of pleasure, nothing else can save you but Jesus Christ who offers you free and clear his salvation. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. I love this picture. This is the same view 
ultimately is a little while ago, a little different picture. But um, my wife especially, but I also have a habit of taking pictures of the rainbows that appear in that view. And I went through my camera on my phone, and I just typed in rainbows in the photos, and I got 45 pictures of rainbows in that same view over the last seven years. And every time I see one, it's a reminder to me that God has promised something more than what we have in our lives right now. God has promised something deeper, richer, and fuller. God promises that I will be with you through your trials. He promises that he is your savior, that he created you for glory, and that you are his witnesses. Can you say with me, it is I, the Lord, the first and the last, I alone and he. That final application question. I only lost a couple people after all, so that's nice. Will your life demonstrate a true and faithful witness of who God is? In my view, it's the only way that we will see the people of this region touched by the glory of God because he wants to see it in each one of you. It doesn't, it doesn't rely on me to make this message go forward. It doesn't rely on media. We think this is the final answer. The only thing it can rely on is the clear witness through every single one of God's children who believe in his name. Are you willing to be one of those demonstrations of God's glory? So here in the cosmic courtroom, the trial of God and his own people, he promised he promises to bring them back uh, as his own people. He wants us to demonstrate his truth, his mercy, his justice. And he says, rise up, O church of God, rise up. This is not a time in history to sleep. It's not a time to slumber. Rise up, O church of God, because you are called not to be the church defeated, not to be the, the member of the church, the Christian who is so assailed by whatever sin befalls you. He's called you to be victorious in Christ and to rise up and to stand up and to be the church victorious, taking his word, his truth to every nation in this world so that Jesus may come. Let's rise up and sing him number 615, Rise Up, O Church of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ. Tread where his feet have trod. Disciples of the Son of Man, rise up, O Church of God. O Lord our God, we ask that you will show us who you are, that you will cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness, that you will continue to renew your purpose in us, and that we will truly rise up and follow you as a witness to the nations. Do this in us. Do this for us. Do it to your glory, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Would you mind getting my cord and my dongle and my computer and putting them in there?